Hey, thanks, Eric. Uh, my class is up there right now. Uh, Jim's covering it, so that's why he's up here. Um, so look, I'm going to set expectations first. This is a very difficult talk, and I tried to figure out how to give it. I really couldn't quite figure out how to give it, because I don't know that I've ever seen a talk of this genre before. So what I decided to do was, since the goal is to really give people a sense of, well, what would come next, crazy as it sounds, I'm going to try to give you a sense of what the content is in 110 and what the experience of learning it is like for the students. Uh, so 13 weeks in an hour, here we go. Everybody likes to sort of have a pigeonhole first, so I'm going to start with a very quick summary. So who takes 110? About 1,300 students have completed or are taking it. Uh, mostly first and second year, 60% male, more than half science, but a quarter arts. First term is bigger than second term. Only a small number of students are declared CPSC majors by the time they take it, but some of this undeclared batch is going to switch to CPSC. But over half of the course is declared some other major. This number I think is the most interesting. At the time they take the course, about 40% are kind of in the looking around, I'm not too sure what I want to do next category. And I think that's, that, that number is something that we targeted in our thinking about the course. I haven't done this room in a while, so I forgot to do that. Okay, uh, the subject matter. So the course is about systematic design of small programs. And the thing that distinguishes it most from other courses you may have seen, and that I'm going to try to give you a sense of today, is that it teaches design method. It's a design method course. It's based on the How to Design Programs book by Feliasen and a bunch of other people. And that book is basically based on circa mid-90s uh, state-of-the-art work in structural recursion types and uh, Michael Jackson's uh, program for the design method. Uh, and since then, there's been some stuff added having to do with natural programming. The technical platform is a series of four very small dynamically typed languages, and I do mean small. The first is a first order pure functional language. The last is a first class language with mutable variables and structures. And structures. We don't use a static type system because these people's research shows that a static type system is particularly difficult for beginning students to understand. But we use a static type system in comments. So it's not formally checked, but we do use it. And you'll see what a role it plays. The first type system is a first, uh, first order type system with union and compound types. And it becomes a uh, a uh, type system with one parametric data type and some parametric function types. We use a special development environment, which takes advantage of the fact that the languages are so small to make the error messages quite good. So the error message when you have an undefined variable in the first pr programming language is much easier to understand than it would be in any other language. And that helps the students uh, learn how to debug and stuff. The weekly format is three hours of lecture and three hours of lab. In the lecture, we're using a sort of partly flipped classroom where we do some exercises in lecture. So there's some presentation. There's presentation interactive, interactive design where the lecturer sort of designs with the class. And then there's exercises. Um, that's quite difficult to do, and we'll talk about that later. It's a zero PowerPoint course. Because we're teaching a design method, and this is the thing I'm going to say a bunch of times, showing the end product is of no value whatsoever. We have to show how we get there. So it has to be interactive in order to work. And that has complications as well that I'll talk about. Uh, the lab is a huge part of the course, and we'll talk about some of that later. We have three TAs in the lab. There's a weekly quiz in the lab that's based on the homework. So who teaches the course? So far, there have been 14 sections. Uh, Paul, Kurt, Hen, Jim, who's upstairs, Joanna and I have done them. There's been a huge amount of lab and infrastructure development. Uh, and so Kim did the first version of the labs. Ryan uh, worked on the labs and the infrastructure. Christina worked on the labs. The labs have gotten a lot of work. Christina's here. Was Kim here? Did I? <coughs> He's not here. Uh, Alex is right there. Alex basically scaled up the operation of the course in terms of managing, managing the whole TA infrastructure. And Taya's making her mark now, so we'll see what she does. Uh, but it'll be good. And these are just some of the great TAs that we've had. Um, TAs, as you know, in a course like this, they spend more contact time with the students than anybody else. And a lot of what the students le learn about skills comes from the TAs. OK, that was my quick summary. I'll take a breath.
So now I want to start and show you the core design methods. There's three up in the right-hand corner. I'll tell you the acronyms in a minute. The hardest thing about teaching design method is that in order to teach design method, you have to start with a simple example. But what methods do is they make simple examples three times harder than they would be if you don't use a method. Methods make hard problems easy, but they make simple problems harder than they would be. And so there's a great difficulty in the beginning of the course, which is that you're showing people, especially people who are already not on a program, how it's going to take 15 minutes to design a function that they could have written in 15 seconds. And you're going to see that too, so be patient. And that's what these people are saying. So consider a program that's simulating a simple traffic light. So the light goes red, green, yeah, well, we don't use sort of Vancouver's killer traffic lights that flash. Um, so what we got to do first is design a representation of the light color. So in order to do that, we're going to use a design method called how to design data. And in these slides, I'll, I'll be constantly trying to remind you which method we're on. But we're going to start with how to design data, and here's how it works. Step one is you identify the form of the information. So first you start with a file that looks like this, that has the program description and the data definitions. So the information in this case consists of a fixed number of discrete values. Right? The light can be red, or yellow, or green. So the design method says to use an enumeration for that. And in our type system, we write enumerations like this. In Java, you would use an enum. In C, you would do that silly thing about using numbers like 0, 1, and 2. In whatever language you were using, you would use that language version of enumeration. But this is an enumeration in this language, or in this, in this method. So I've done, I've identified the form of the information and I've written the type comment. Now there's a thing we do called the interpretation, which always explains what data, how you take data to mean information. In the case of an enumeration like this, it's difficult to understand the interpretation. But imagine if I had used 0, 1, and 2 here instead of red, yellow, and green. Then the interpretation would say something, whoa, this is means. Then the interpretation, ah, you can't see if I point like that, I'll try not to. Then the interpretation would say something like 0 is red, 1 is yellow, and 2 is green. Right? In that case, the interpretation is really doing some work, because you might forget what 0 is. Okay. Um, it's a very big thing here we'll talk about more. Students really are required to work very hard on having a clear relationship between information to be represented and, and data that represents it. That's what comes from Jackson's problem frames approach. Most data definitions have examples. For enumerations, it's, it's redundant to have examples, but you'll see some examples later, so now I'm here. And then there's a thing called a template, which is a piece of, of the book that actually we've done a, a great deal of, of um, enhancements on. The idea of the template is, so Kathy describes it, Kathy Fisler describes it as everything you can wring out of the type comment. The way I like to describe it is the template is everything that the type tells you about every function that will operate on the data. So in this case, the type has three cases. The thing is either red, yellow, or green. And so what this template is telling you, for people who can't read parentheses, is this template is telling you, hey, you know what? If a function's operating on a traffic light, there's three cases. Stop it. There's three cases. If it's red, we'll do something. If it's yellow, we'll do something. If it's green, we'll do something. The important role of the template, of course, will come up in harder examples. Remember the thing that I said five minutes ago. I'm making a trivial problem hard. That's what methods do. In a minute, we're going to see some very hard problems that are made easy. But I've got to go through this first. So there's the template. Oh, I should have said it. So my plan is to talk pretty much uninterrupted. I will not look in Alan Hood's direction for about 55 minutes. And then take questions. Um, oh, that's not what I wanted to do next. So here's the template. And I'm done designing the data. Now we'll go on. Oh, so we've given this question a question like this four times on midterms and finals. We keep per question scores on every midterm and final. We've given a question like this four times for a 70% average. I'll talk later, but that number is actually I think very good, uh, in part because this is actually a hard thing to do, 
uh, in part because we're very particular on the first midterms about following the recipe exactly. So some people are losing points there for not following the details of our method. Um, so now the second thing I was asked to do was design a function that computes the next color. Okay. So now I'm going to follow the how to design functions process. Mark HTDF up here. Here we go. So functions in a file always come after data definitions. The first thing you do is you write the signature and purpose and stub. I'm going to do the signature and purpose first. The signature is basically the static type signature of the function. So this function is going to consume a traffic light and it's going to produce a traffic light. And the purpose is that it's going to produce the next color of the light in the usual order. So if I give it red, it'll give me green. And now we'll talk about the stub. So the stub is a funny little thing. It's basically a piece of scaffolding intended to support test-driven development, right? Which is a sort of variant of agile development where you write examples first. And this method is always been about writing examples first. So the idea is that this is a version of the function that just happens to return a value that's sometimes right. Okay? That's all it has to do. So that's the stub right here. The next step in the method is to write examples. So by examples, I mean here's how we write them and here's how you should read this. I'm loving this. I'm loving this track pattern. I'm really loving it. Oh, right. I mean, brought a mouse. Forgot to attach it. It's not like this one. Uh, so that says, if I call a function next, with red, I should expect to get green. This is an example. And because I've wrapped it in check expect, that's a unit testing framework that the course uses. Um, we'll later use it as a test. But for now, it's an example. So that's good. So let me make another example. There's another example. And if I run the examples when only I have, all I have is a stub, well, of course, one of the tests will fail because this thing is returning red every time. And when I call it with Call it with red, I'm not getting green back. So the, the unit test framework says, well, that failed. But that's okay. What I know now is that my examples are syntactically correct. They have the correct number of arguments, dot, dot, dot. I'm here. Next, I take the template. And the way I take the template is I go up here to the data definition, and I will take this copy it down here, rename it to give it the name next, and now I have this template. Now look at what I have. This is very important. I now have three different descriptions of what the function is supposed to do, very different kinds of descriptions of what it's supposed to do, as well as a description of the raw ingredients to work with. The signature tells me, you know, you're getting a traffic light and you're producing a traffic light. The purpose tells me a little bit more about that. The purpose tells me a little bit more about that. It's abstract, right? This is abstract in English. This is concrete, specific examples, but code. And this thing here says, by the way, the primitives available to you for operating on this data is that there's three cases. So what this does is one of the hardest things for students about learning to write functions or methods or procedures, whatever you do the first time, is there's this huge abstraction gap. Right? I have to write a thing that works in general. And they, they, they struggle with that a lot. What this has done is it's kind of brought both sides of the bridge closer together. More of the structure of what you have to work with clear here, and there's more concrete examples here. And so what people do in this method is, if they have cases down here, they're told, well, find an example that tells you what this case is supposed to do, and use that example to help you complete it. So now the code is completed. Obviously, those of you who are fast can see that I put a problem in it. We'll come to that. The next step of the recipe is to run the tests and debug. Now I run this, and it says, well, you know, one test is failing. You told me that if I called next with red, I should get green. And I, instead, I got red. 
Oops. Sorry, I really apologize for this. I need to practice with this pad. Um, oh, of course, the problem here is that this is saying to produce red in the case of red instead of saying to produce green. So I'll go edit that and run it again. Now, both tests passed. What that black means is that code didn't execute. We spent a fair amount, well, let me, I don't know, I'll say this now. We spent a fair amount of time in 110 talking about what's enough tests. <laughs> Clearly, the bare minimum for enough tests is you have to have code coverage. If you don't have code coverage, you don't have enough tests. Okay? So this code didn't even run. <clears throat> so, you know, you never hand in something that has this property. You say, oh, well, I don't have a test for this case. You add that third test. Now all three tests pass. We'll see some more examples in a minute about more subtle cases of testing, but code coverage is the minimum that we settle for. And this all three tests pass. You know, there's lots of all tests pass in the course evaluations. Right? It's kind of it's a you know, you know, all tests pass and they smile. Right? So I've been struggling with this thing for a while, all tests pass. All is well. It's very good for the students when they see all tests pass. And then one of the things we're trying to work on is it doesn't always mean that you're, you're winning, right? <laughs> the tests could be wrong, you might not have enough, but they do like the all test pass thing. Let's go on. So in terms of uh, the how to design functions process, somewhat miraculously doing HTDF on an enumeration, on an enumeration, We've only asked once, and that question was had some very serious flaws. So we don't have any real data on that. Um, uh, there's nobody here who's taken it. This is a midterm Monday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we don't have data on, on this. We do know that by the end of the course, they're able to do much harder things than HTDF on, on an enumeration. The question here would just be, what are they able to do at midterm one? So one of the things you've seen here already that's really fundamental to this design method is first, we really work hard with students on making a distinction between information to be represented and data that represents it. Okay? So 16 degrees Celsius, you know, the temperature is 16 degrees Celsius is information, the number 16 is data. And really trying to have that relationship clear. This method stresses that. And then, because in part it stresses that, what happens is students learn to recognize that there's different forms of information, atomic information, distinct cases, fixed number of cases, compound information, arbitrary size information. So this is getting down into trees and that stuff. And because of this templating process, what happens is that the structure of the information in the problem domain drives the structure of the data in the program, and that drives the structure of the whole program. One of the things that 110 is setting students up to understand, and you know, this is not something they, you know, they, they clearly have by the end of the course, but one of the things we're setting them up to understand is that in designing programs, you know, the big decisions are mostly made by the time you're done with the data. How you shape the data has huge impact on programs. And we talked to them about the fact that you know, data architecture is a big part of you know, a lot of great IT system design. We talked to them about that in the passing. Okay, here's another problem. This is from week three. So in this problem, the one I just did was a lecture problem. This is a homework problem. In this problem, they're supposed to make a cow that walks back and forth across the screen. And uh, if you press the space bar, it changes directions. And we show them Robert Britson's smoke video and Harry Potter in the first lecture. And we say, this is animation two. <laughs> it's just some more math. Uh, we're very honest about that. It's never going to look quite as good as, as, as Harry Potter. Um, so here we go. Now we're going to follow a thing called the How to Design Worlds recipe, because this is an interactive world program. So the recipe works like this. First thing you do is you make several sketches of street, screen states, at least three sketches of screen states. I'm not such a good drawer, so that's a cow. 
Once you have those three sketches, you identify three things. You identify constant information, so the width and height of the screen. MTS is an abbreviation for the background. Yes, who wrote the book has an interesting sense of humor. It's empty scene. Empty scene. MTS. It's the background. The cow itself doesn't change. Its, high, its, its Y position doesn't change. So those are the constants. You identify the changing information, so the cow's X position and its velocity is changing. And you identify which user interface framework options you need. In this case, you need the tick thing, because it's going to change with passing time. You need the draw feature, because you want to see something. And you need the key handler feature, because when you press the space bar, you want something to happen. So that's what they call a domain analysis, and identifying constant and changing information and identifying UI, UI frameworks and the options needed. They make it. Then, they go to code. Yeah. Then they go to code. Not a very lot of track pad surface here. So, the code looks like that. The file, once again, is highly structured. The constants come first, and the constants must correspond with the picture. The picture and the first part of the program don't correspond, that's not good enough. So, there's the width, there's the height, there's the cow's y position, there's the cow facing one way, there's the cow facing the other way, there's the empty seat. And then they have to identify the changing information. And when they've done that, and now they have to have data definitions for the changing information. So here's the data definition for the changing information. I'm sorry, can you? When I moved this to this machine, I didn't set the screen size. And let's see if I can, the font size, let's see if I can manage to pull that off of Windows. Uh, edit preferences. Is it edit preferences? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, it's control send instead of control comma. Sorry, folks. I think that was worth it. So here's the uh, data definition for the changing information. Now, this cow has two changing properties. And so now we're all the way over here in the how to design data recipe, actually. Because we've got to design data for this cow. And two changing properties is compound data, right? A single cow has two properties. So it's compound data, and we use the record <coughs> system that we use. The record system says there are things called cows that have two properties. And again, we say, well, a cow is these two numbers. And the first thing is its sex position, and the second thing is its velocity. And here you start to see examples be more interesting. Because this is an example of a cow that's heading right, and this is an example of a cow that's heading left. It really helps students a lot to sort of have gotten very clear about what the data might be and how it might vary up front. <coughs> and here's the template. Well, the template for compound data just says, you know, there's two selectors on the thing. You can either, if you're given a cow, you can get its x or its, I don't know why that says y, or its dx. I won't talk much about this next step, but in the UI framework, there's this thing called Big Bang. Again, this is Matthias' sense of humor. You take lots of different functions, you squeeze them together, you get a world. Big Bang. It's not funny. <laughs> but Big Bang is the thing that is the UI framework thing. We talk about it, but it's not terribly uh, interesting for right now. And what's happened now is that this world design method has taken them to a place where there's two functions to design that. There's actually three in the one I did on the board, but there's two here for time. One is the function that, given the current position of the cow, gives you the next position of the cow. Given the current position and velocity of the cow, gives you the next position of the cow. And the other is the function that draws the cow. So here I've designed those following HTDF. And one of the things that's kind of nice, the way we do this example in lecture, the first time, is the framework spits out two functions. And then we give half the class one function to do, and the other half the class the other function to do. 
and in lecture, and then put them together to illustrate that by following a systematic design method and having these clear interfaces already, different people can do different things and you can put it back together. And that works, it works sometimes. <laughs> I mean, you have to, you have to take the <coughs> examples back, and you have to take the examples back that are, you can't take the perfect examples back because then the people who don't have perfect examples don't learn from it. But you have to take the examples that aren't too far off or else you don't have time. At any rate, let me just show you some of this. So here's a case where testing is much more complicated. Right? You've got to test a bunch of cases. You've got to test the case where the cow's in the middle going left, the middle's going right. You've got to test the case where the cow hits the left. You've got to test the case the right. You've got to test the case where the cow hits the left. And already in week three, we're kind of working them pretty hard about you know, how all your examples worked out. Now this turns out to be very important. This example thing makes the function design much simpler. Because first you work out all the boundary conditions before you try to write the code. First you work out all the boundary conditions before you try to write the code. And that tends to help people help people get this right. You know, I'll be straight with you, there's some people who have some problems with some of these boundary conditions. And cows tend to sometimes go a little bit too far, a little bit not far enough. But it is a good, it's a good learning example. So that's a cow. So we've given three midterm one problems of completing a world program. And, you know, we're getting 60% on that. Well, I actually think that's pretty good. I know 60 doesn't seem like a high number. This is hard. Okay? You know, here's design a world. We never give them a completely blank slate, but we give them complete stuff. And what it really is trying people on is, can you focus? And you focus on designing this one function, even though it's in the middle of this whole world. And by week four, there's a lot of students who don't quite have that yet. Um, in particular, we'll, we'll talk about this some later. One of the reasons some of them don't have it is the thing I alluded to before, which is that at first, the design method seemed kind of boring. And so they don't quite pay attention to the design method enough, some of them, right away. And then all at once in week three, we're doing world programs. And if you didn't learn the week two design method, it's a bit of a struggle. So I'm going to tell you that that 60 is a pretty good number, because this is a hard problem. Obviously, we'd all like it to be higher, but this is a hard problem. So here's week six. In week six, we do trees, binary trees and arbitrary arity trees. So this is a homework problem. Design the function height that consumes a binary search tree and produces its height. Now here's where you're going to start to see all the stuff that we've been talking about pay off. Because this problem is going to be a lot easier for long tense students than for students who do not have this method. Let me show you why. So the first thing is you've got these type cards, right? And let me just zoom in on this a bit. So look, a binary search tree is either a leaf node, which will represent as false, or it's a non-leaf node which has a key and a value and then two children, right? In our notation, that's what that looks like. So it's either a leaf or a non-leaf. Now, what 110 students learn how to do for these kinds of data definitions is a thing called reference analysis. And they say, well, look, here's a reference to another type, a non-primitive type. And I'll draw an arrow to what defines it. Now these are two self-references. One of the things that happens in 110 is students learn how to write recursive programs fairly quickly because of what's about to happen here, which is it falls out quite naturally. So those are two self-references. Because there's two self-references, the template will have two what we call natural recursions. Here we go. I'm going to follow the HTDF process. I'm going to go back over here now. So there's the data definition. Well, here I've got some nice examples of the tree. I put a little picture of the tree that I have examples of so I can see what I'm doing. The template, here's the template. Well, look, the type had two cases, false and the node. The template has two cases, false and the node. And in this case, because there are two self-references, there are two natural recursions here. And that just comes out of the template rules. You just crank that out. 
But now, I set myself up to do the function. So the function consumes a BST and produces a natural number, the height of the BST. Before you freak out, in our book, zero is a natural number. It's just, it's just no use fighting that fight. In our book, zero is a natural number. Um, so the height of the BST, false is zero, nodes are one plus the max of the left and right heights. Now the examples are really going to start to do some work for me. Okay? So the height of false is zero, the height of this simple tree here is one. And one of the things that students are able to talk about at this point in the course, because we've been working this test stuff, is you better get yourself an example where the highest thing is in the left and a different example where the highest thing is in the right. Otherwise, you, know, you can have your arguments max messed up and it won't come out right. So this, this program doesn't get maximum points on an exam unless it has a test for both for both the highest thing being the left branch and the highest thing being the right branch. There's the stub again. And what was I going to do? Well, I was actually going to do it. So I'll do it. I'll take my template. Not even breathing on that trackpad. I'll comment out the stub. Oh, what was that? I was going to use my other religion, but my other my spare machine in the other religion wasn't working. I've copied the template. Now I have to rename. Is Control C not copy? Yes. I rename the template, and I rename the natural recursions. And now I'm going to go back to week two. I got some examples. I've got a template. What do the examples and the purpose tell me? Let's see. The examples are telling me that if BST0 happens to be false, and the purpose is telling me that if it's false, this ought to be 0. And let's see. It's 1 plus <coughs> the max of the left and right heights. So let's see. It's just add 1. Because the recursion came out of the method. The recursion didn't get messed up because the recursion came out of the method. All they really have to think about is, what do I want to do if the black place is in the template? There's a very important point here, which I... This is something that if you don't think about method, it's hard to understand. But the template is a phase. In the final resulting system, there is no subcomponent called the template. Most of us, when we think about programming, are, are used to thinking about decomposition as resulting in final component pieces. So there'll be this runtime module or that runtime module or something like that. When you think about method, you can have subcomponents that are phases. And that's what's going on with the template. The template is a period of time in which I understand the structure of the data and its implications for all functions that operate on the data. In the final program, there isn't a thing that's called the template. It's gone. But it did its job. So they do very well on this. This is midterm two. By now, they're doing much better with the recipes. 79% uh, for the data definition of a BST and 57% for the function uh, definition of BST. Now, I would claim to you that that 50% is actually quite high because bear in mind that about 35% of these people are going to be computer science majors, more or less tops. This is a week of the course where we're asking a lot of students to just be patient. We kind of, we'll talk more about this, but one problem is we've got this mixed class. We want to give our really good computer science students some meat to chew on. We kind of, there's a little bit of stuff that goes by here. So that 57% is a number that I'm pretty happy with, because there's some students who did not take this class intending to learn about binary search trees. I assure you that. Okay. 
Right. Okay, so that's the end of the core design methods. The course has six learning goals, all of which basically cross-cut the design methods. So I'm not going to do a correspondence with all the learning goals. But I want to pull out one of the learning goals that is quite important. And it's one of the things that we really tried to do with the whole 110, 210, and hopefully later uh, other, other uh, SPL courses. One of the things that motivated us is we believe that it's important for students to learn how to work with code and models of code at the same time. We sort of think that this is a thing that distinguishes the quality of developers. Developers who can do this tend to be better. We think it distinguishes the longevity of developers because it helps you move up the value chain. Uh, we think it's a foundation for the rest of our, the software development track. And we also think that it's a foundation for the re relation to other tracks in the curriculum. Any other part of the curriculum that is in some sense a domain theory, right, is, is exactly going to do that. It's going to say, look, here's a domain in which here's a model. Now try to write a program that corresponds to that model. We want to set people up to be ready to think about that at the beginning. I want to show you three, and we talk about this very explicitly, oh, what do I need to show here? So here's the 110 goal. The 110 goal is understand how programs can be described using notations other than code, and how these can facilitate program design. And of course, in order to be a learning goal, it has to be accessible. So the way it's demonstrated is by being able to identify correspondences between non-code models and the program itself, and by being able to use non-code models in program design. 210 is roughly the same thing, but kind of more so. And then 310 would be more so. So here we go. The type comments you've been seeing are the first model. And let me let me say a bit more about that. So this is from lecture. This is lecture week. Um, this is the arbitrary. This is the arbitrary week. Uh, area of truth, so this is week six. We have this little photo organizer program. They do. Okay? We do it in lecture. Now, a photo organizer is an arbitrary arity tree, right? Because any directory can have any number of other directories, and they can have any number of pictures in them. So it's an arbitrary arity tree. So the type definitions for an arbitrary arity tree are these. I'm not going to go through them in detail. I don't have time to do that. But here's the big thing. You do the reference analysis on this, and you end up with two self-reference cycles, and a mutual reference cycle. And what 110 students understand is um, this, this point is perhaps a bit solid. I wouldn't say everybody totally knows this. Is you need two cycles because one cycle gets you arbitrary depth and one cycle gets you arbitrary breadth. Okay? If you want to think about it in terms of loops and, and arrays, you need arbitrary lengths to go down and at any level you need an array of arbitrary size to go down. So they do this reference analysis, and then what they do is they generate the template, and they establish a correspondence between each reference arrow and the function calls in the template. So you know, this one here says, I'm sitting in a directory, and I need to go operate on its list of directories. That's here, the type system. In the templates, here I am operating on a directory. When I want to operate on its list of subdirectories, I need to call a function for doing that. And they set this correspondence up. We work quite hard on this. Now watch. Once they have the template, what they know is that the template is a traversal of, of the arbitrary area tree. It's just missing what you should do. And so any function that operates on this data, I know this is getting small. Any function that operates on this data, so here's a function here, a set of functions that's going to count how many images there are. And here's a set of functions that's going to render them. These are just fillings of the template. Here, we add. The base case is 0. And whenever we see a directory, we add 1. Here. We use primitives called beside a line and above a line, which are just primitives for composing images. The base case is where did it go? The base case is blank. <coughs> They're exactly the same. A little bit different. And this is something that one of my students do, do truly understand. I got this up. I got this example. Actually, 
which I made a suggestion um, that I included in here. When I did this lecture, I walked around and I saw a student who had basically built this exact picture, except because she had you know, no people who have a mega perfect, fantastic handwriting, which you love to grade their exams. She hadn't even written these two out in practice. She had just had two different colors filling in the template. But all the students really do get this point. And the test data shows it. Uh, for arbitrary area trees, uh, we've asked it one time for data design and gotten 68%, and twice for function design and gotten 77%. Because by this point, they really kind of are seeing. I don't have to understand every line of that template. I can think about it in terms of the type comments and just know whatever goes here is the thing that composes the two recursive calls. And for the graph, we've also, you take this one more step and you get a graph. Take this one more step and you get a graph, of course. Um, and that's quite a hard question, uh, but we got 56% of that. Okay, so this one, now I really have to start to pick up the speed here. So here's another example. In this example, basically, they have to write a function that takes string uh, lists of characters and a pattern. The pattern is A, N. Those are the two pattern keywords. So this is, alf this is alphabetic, numeric, alphabetic, numeric, alphabetic, numeric, and match them like that. So, in what they've learned to this point, they would generate a cross product. This, um, this type has three cases, this type has two cases. They would generate a six case cross product. I'm just going to show you very quickly that what we talk about them doing is well, because they understand the type comments so well, they can instead take the cross product of the type comments rather than generate the six case com and do simplification at the type comment level. So here, by recognizing that that whole column is true and that that remaining row is false, they reduce this to a six-case function. You would uh, to a, a four-case function. You would reduce it to a four-case function too, uh, and because you're experienced, you would reduce it to a four-case function probably in your head before writing it. But they're going to reduce it accurately and be able to show you the correspondence between the work they did here. I don't have data for that question because I just dug those up um, thanks to Chelsea's up yesterday. One more example of models and code that we do is we have a lab on finite state machine acceptors. I really don't have time to talk about this, but basically we give them a, uh, a data definition for finite state machines and they build one and then they build an engine for interpreting the finite state machines. And we talked a little bit about how you know, it's the usual thing, this very indirect route of first implementing finite state machines causes the code that recognizes integers to be a lot easier to understand than if you wrote it the other way. And of course, recognizing just integers would probably be okay, but if you really started to make, make a tokenizer for uh, something harder. So that's our three, um, three examples of, um, of um, very explicit attention to models and code and correspondence. I want to talk briefly about the labs. The labs are a huge part of this course, and as I said, some of the people in here, Christina, Ryan's, Ryan's, you've got Ryan hard at work, right? Ryan's hard at work. Um, Kim's not here. They've worked a lot on these. Um, uh, everybody really has. Um, they do a huge piece of work in the course. So let me tell you something about the labs. So the first lab is just kind of make your account work. Uh, and do some other learning things. Then we have a lab on the HTDF recipe where each TA sits with a student and walks them through the HTDF recipe to make sure they can do it. The next lab is a sort of Times Square ball drop, right? It counts down from midnight as it falls and then it says Happy New Year. The next lab is a simple one-line text editor where they can type that in and it does backwards. The next gap is a simple snake game. Uh, you've got a three element snake that you drive around the screen. And the next lab is a simple mashup where you go out to eBay and you get the location of a bunch of items for sale, and then you go out to the Google Maps API and get that plotted on there. That's the first six labs. <coughs> the next lab is the mutually recursive structure one. It's not pretty. I mean, you just you don't have it pretty up yet. Uh, 
Um, the next lab is a simple Twitter-like client where you, know, you, you can type at different windows and it shows up in all the windows. The next lab is the finite state machine acceptors. And you revisit the snake game. In this version of the snake game, there's some food. And if you grab the food, the snake gets longer. And the final lab is a very simple Pac-Man. So there's a couple, there's a number of properties in these labs that, that I think are important. Um, one of them is you notice they kind of, they're all kind of do something. Almost all of them do something. They're kind of neat to look at. Uh, they have, they, you can take them home and show them to your parents' property. Right? in a way that you know, some labs just don't. Um, they're also chosen to be illustrative of, that's a very strange effect there. They're also chosen to be illustrative of how programs that, these, that people use every day kind of work. So the editor is kind of like an editor, and the Twitter thing is kind of like a Twitter thing. And we talk about how the, rec the coloring that Dr. Rackett does might, do, might work this way. So really trying to give people a sense of, you know, the stuff that's around you isn't mysterious. Right? And we can tell them perfectly straight. The center of every editor you've always, always used has data structures exactly like these, only a bit more complicated. Um, and, and we really get um, some quite good feedback we'll talk about later um, from students about, about that demystifying the world around them through these labs. Now, they're simple. They're simple. Um, but there is a bit of demystification that happens that way. I think it's good. Okay, other topics. I'm going to make my time window. I need to take one breath when this is over. Um, <clears throat> we talked a little bit about loop tail recursion equivalents, and we do explicit for each loops. Um, we talk about accumulators. Uh, we set them up for the, um, you know, the real hard, the real hard interview question about how do you traverse an arbitrary size, size graph, um, given that you get stack overflow. Right, we do that with two accumulators. Uh, we do, there's a place in, in the week after the uh, trees where this is really where kind of the lecture is hard to deliver because you really have to get some of the students who aren't intending to be computer science majors to give you some patience. Uh, we do a web crawler, a real web crawler that goes out and brings stuff in and maintains a work list and a found list. Um, and so that's a two accumulator thing. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of the peak of complexity of the term right there. Um, we do a thing with natural numbers represented as tally marks. Uh, a lot of the other people who do this course um, do a lab on big number representation. Uh, and what's going on there is you're really trying to get people to understand that there is no such thing as primitive data. All data is a thing that somebody decided to implement and you have chosen to interpret as something. And so even numbers are primitive data. And, and to show you that, let's make some new numbers. Now these are kind of ridiculous numbers to make. Right? You, you also get to talk about how some data representations are really a great deal better than other data representations. Because um, you do fact of eight or nine on your laptop and you can kind of talk for a couple of minutes before it comes back this way. Because um, um, if, if all you have is add one and sub one, it's math. TAs. TAs are kind of what make it work. Um, uh, we have fantastic TAs, some of them are here, uh, but we didn't have fantastic TAs. Uh, most of them are people who did extremely well in the course, but some of them are people who only did well, but demonstrated uh, you know, that they really can talk about the stuff well, that people who ask great questions in class. Uh, uh, being able to ask great questions is more, is at least as important as doing well, because TAs, in order, you know, they kind of got to talk. <laughs> so, you know, we really, we really stress that. Um, our TAs are drawn from a wide variety of programs. Basically, vis-a-vis -vis the population of the course, our TAs are shifted more towards computer science. But vis-a-vis -vis every other course in the department, our TAs are shifted well away from computer science. The lead TA of this term is in commerce. Uh, uh, because we're, we're putting TAs out there who are like the students that they're TA in for. Um, you've got a roughly even gender split. It doesn't always work out. Part of why it doesn't always work out is Where's Rachel? Because your, your husband has stolen a lot of great females. Yes, for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
we get great TAs, and when we get great TAs, you have to be happy to see them go. And you're not happy to see them go, but happy that other people have them. Uh, but we, we, we try to get the gender split to match the class to the best extent we can. Uh, our TAs at this point in the course have started sending us, and we did this last year, a roughly one paragraph description on the lab work of every student in the lab who did sort of the low average um, for each individual student. That's a lot to read, but, but I learned from Paul that early intervention is what makes the difference. And now the instructor can kind of go sending out to that student and say, why don't you come talk to me about it because I know something about how your labs are going. Okay. <clears throat> So now we're going to talk about challenges. So here's some quotes from student evaluations about some of the things that are hard. Well, the first student thought, it was boring to tears at first, and then it was interesting. And then the second student thought the design process was infuriating at first, and later I couldn't have gotten by without it. The third student thought that 110 was a bit too much. <laughs> and the fourth student thought that the written tests were a bit of a bummer because the whole design method we teach them is intended to work on a computer and then uh, for 50% of their grade we take the computer away or 60% of the grade we take their computer away. So, you know, obviously I've picked these, but I've picked them representative. These are not, every comment you've seen here is one of many exactly like it. So let me talk about these challenges. Diversity of class is a huge structural challenge. Uh, it also makes it quite interesting, but it's a challenge. You know, 25% are arts. A lot of those people don't have math 12. So the, the quote simplicity of mathematical examples, we, we can't rely on that. We use other examples. Yeah, but as a result, the examples are prettier and more interesting, but you didn't take long to explain. Uh, there's a lot of other majors in there, and then there's some people who can already program. And they cause most of the trouble, or some of the trouble. If we could have three intro streams with the same design method base, it would be a lot easier, uh, of course, which just be a great deal easier to run. And, and the experience would be better for everyone in the class. But I, I don't know how to make that work at UBC. The course has very time-consuming lecture elements. Design method is very time-consuming to lecture because you can't show the result. I'll do a little bit of that, but you really have to very often say, OK, so now I look here, and I look here, and I look here, and I compare this to that and I type this. That just takes a lot longer than say, look at the pretty function I make. Okay? It just takes longer. Um, uh, it's good, but it takes longer. We use the partially flipped classroom, so there's a lot of exercises. You know, exercises like that one I told you about where I did the world program and I gave half the class the next function and half the class the render function. But the next function and the render function at that point in the course aren't that hard. On the other hand, it takes the students three or four or five times longer to do them themselves than if I just do them in front of them. I mean, that's just a fact. They're not as fast as them. So that takes time. It means that lectures in 110 are, are very difficult to pull off. You kind of, you really have to, you can't waste any time in places where you're not intending to invest the time. Um, uh, and you have to kind of walk around the room and see what people are doing and think of interesting things to say. They're just difficult to pull off. I think they're great, but it, it's, this is a big, these lecture elements are, 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 are a problem. I'm going to talk about some solutions in a minute. The design method seems terribly cumbersome at first, so some students get bored, and other students rebel. And, and, and then the students who've never programmed before disproportionately kick those first students posteriors in week four, because they've learned the recipe, and now, you know, the week four program is easier for them to do. So we have this problem that a bunch of people have to start catching up between weeks three and four and five. Um, and we, I think we say it in as clear a terms as possible that it would be a bad idea to not learn the recipe. It's just hard for some people because it seems cumbersome and if they already know how to program it seems more cumbersome. The offline exams is a huge problem. It's just structurally unfair that we're teaching an interactive design skill and then you give them paper and pencil. It's just, it's just, it's just wrong. Um, but it's a wrong that I have no idea how you fix. Um, and then there's just the management stuff having to do with a big class. Um, so here's some more data from our um, surveys. Uh, we ask about workload because you, you get comments about workload. But when you look at the survey, comments about the workload. Roughly speaking, this is people are saying these people are saying it's much, much more work 
than a corresponding four credit course. It's more work, it's about the same, it's less, it's much less. So this isn't completely even, but it isn't strongly skewed towards much, much more. Um, it, it, it's skewed that way, but it's, it's, it's not strongly skewed that way. The good thing is that they think they get more out of it than they put into it. So, I think that's good somehow. Here's the grade distribution. So this is through nine sections, I think. I don't know exactly. Um, uh, so, the, you know, this average is kind of high here. These are the people who fail, right? People who have these grades here are the people who fail the winter, or fail the final exam, and so we have to knock them down to 45. This number was 18% in the first big term, and it was 11% in the last big term. In 111, the number used to be about 15%. So this is about this is about um, about in line. Um, those of you who kind of always taught fourth year courses, have you forgotten what this is like? Let me assure you, I, I don't want to sound cold. You, the level of effort that some of these people put in and the level of excellence that they attained, you, you didn't want us passing it to you. <laughs> Obviously, you'd like everybody to get it well, in. Those are the ones who worked really hard to fail. <laughs> um, you know, obviously you'd like everybody to get an A, but that's just not, that's just not reality. More from our survey in terms of general happiness. Now bearing in mind that a chunk of people, you know, 15% of the people are on their way to failing the course. Um, three quarters strongly agree or agree that designing programs is fun. Three quarters strongly agree or agree that everyone has the ability to be good. This is a question that's kind of a proxy for is it fair? If you work, can you do it? Uh, three quarters strongly agree or agree that it's valuable for all. These questions are obviously much longer when we ask them, but this question is basically, no matter what your major is, this course worth taking? And three quarters strongly agree or agree that it is. And more than half say their interest in CS went up. A third say it stayed the same. You know, some people it went down. Um, uh, in a course that's kind of hard, my personal assessment is that these are pretty good numbers. This is my last actual slide. Future plans. So we've got plans in place to further increase the capacity in 2012 by moving one of the fall sections into an even bigger room than we used this fall uh, and allowing the spring sections to, to fill the room they're in. This, this year we allowed the spring sections to fill the room they're in. We didn't fill it, although they were bigger than last year. Uh, the fall, every seat we made available was filled. Uh, and we'll let the summer section go to about this size. So that will increase, uh, increase capacity by about 150 or 160 over this year. Um, we're going to do more work on videos to support the flipped classroom. Right? The idea of the flipped classroom is you do the lecture at home and you do the exercises uh, in class. And you know, we're doing some of that. But if you could take 15 minutes of lecture out of each of those lectures, you know, it wouldn't make you know, you wouldn't just kind of be like totally relaxed, but it would make it a lot easier if you took 15 minutes of lecture on each of those lectures. And we're starting to understand that, that really some, at least in the first half of the course, a little bit of each lecture is mechanism. And that's the kind of thing that a video lecture would be quite good at anyways, because you can do a little bit, you know, and say, pause the video and type. And they can go back and forth. It's material that's really quite well suited to that kind of work. So we're going to work on the video some. We're going to continue expanding the instructor base. Pam and Duran are going to tell you that it was the most rewarding thing they ever did. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much, Pam and Duran. Not another word. <laughs> you can pay us later. <laughs> um, and you know, we're going to keep evolving the, uh, the labs and the design method and stuff. Uh, here's some other sort of sample quotes that people said. I kind of like, I like the first one because I like, I like the idea that you know, for a lot of kids, the systematic problem solving, they've never seen the problem solving method before. Some of them have been good at that, but they've never seen the method before. I like the middle one a lot. The middle one is grumble, 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 grumble. I already knew how to program and I wanted to learn job. But I have to admit my programs are better. <laughs> <laughs> That's the end of the
part where I want to take a big breath and talk as fast as I can for now. It's not as fast as I can. The arbitrary industry is not sure as fast. <laughs> so, you know, I think all of us, there's, we've got TAs, we've got lead TA, we've got Joanne and Hen, we've got Paul, of course, Kurt, we don't have Kurt, Kurt, we don't see him. So we got a bunch of people who can answer questions and, 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 and just talk. Let's see, I need to stand over here. So I can look this way. So we have 30 TAs over what? Uh, uh, you know, it's not an exact number. I think in the fall term, we actually have a little bit more than 30. Okay, yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, your numbers are about like what the introductory course at Waterloo was, but the, what helped that a lot was hiring co-op students who are full-time. Right. And then the, the training time goes way down. I mean, it gets amortized. Um, yeah, you know, that's something we, we could look at doing. Uh, Christina did a bunch of extra work for the summer. Uh, uh, this, you know, these students who tend to hire with one ten years, they are very best students. Uh, what they're giving up in terms of uh, financial rewards for doing that, uh, by doing this instead of that, uh, I don't know. Well, we can certainly, we're certainly not, if a student comes in and says, you know, I'd like to work on this 40 hours a week, uh, we'll try and find a way to get out. <laughs> Uh, I think actually to be fair, I don't know what that is. Oh, go ahead, you're trying to win me anyway. I'm, I was just kidding, go ahead. Okay. So, so this is going to be, I guess, this is going to be in the talk, um, but uh, I'll be nice about it. I mean, this is incredibly cool, and, and I did, it was awesome when you brought Street on and Kathy out, and, and I took that, it was fantastic. And, um, and just also my training background, I, I really believe in the emphasis. Um, and also, I taught 111 a bunch of times, and there are a lot of things in 111 that bugged me. But that said, especially like, you know, when Shino and Kathy are beating up on the typical intro course, and you have examples, the students at the end of 111 could do really cool examples. I could pull out exams and show great things that they've learned. I can show exam results that, you know, they're doing pretty well on the whole, and there's similarly diverse audience. So do we have evidence that we're doing better here somehow? I mean, it's really, really cool, but is oh. it better? For any definition of better. You know, the problem with asking for evidence for a press conference, you know the problem with asking for evidence for a press conference, you know, you can, you can trot out this kind of evidence and you can trot out that kind of evidence and you can't produce another kind of evidence. So here's what we don't have. We don't have, you know, giving them the same problem because they're solving different problems. Um, here's what we don't have. We don't have a longitudinal study of, of uh, their performance in subsequent courses. The problem with doing a logical study of the performances on social courses is a lot of other things have changed. Okay? You know, the word on the street now is this is the place to get jobs. So, you know, if we tried to do a logical study, I mean, you could design one, right? But you wouldn't you wouldn't have any confidence because the, the, the environment has changed, right? So I think we are trying to do some things. Um, 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 I don't know. I will tell you some things that caused us to look at this. We felt in the SPL courses uh, that the students thought that learning a programming language was a big deal, uh, that that's something that it should take six weeks to do, uh, in that they uh, weren't very systematic developers, they knew nothing about agile methods, they knew nothing about testing, uh, they didn't have a good framework for talking about uh, uh, the notion of models and code. Um, so you know, I think these students have that. I'll, I'll tell you the thing they don't have. The thing they don't have is they can't program in Java. Okay? So you know, people who were teaching 111 weren't just sitting on their hands the whole time. There was a lot of stuff going on that in order for us to do this, you know, we can't do. Um, uh, I just don't think you're going to get a clean A-B comparison. Uh, obviously, you'd like a clean A-B comparison, but you're not going to get it. 
Are you seeing those good results in, in the more advanced courses now? Have the first one time forward start from three? We're still, so we don't have any data for courses beyond 211, and we're still 210, and we're still collecting data for 210. Um, Will is next one. So I, I don't know if this is a question for you or for the TAs that are in the room that have taken 221. But I'm sitting here making a list of things that I can take out of 221 so that we can put more data structures in. And I want to know, uh, is it a good idea to do that? Like you do tail recursion elimination, so that's they great. They forgot. This term they forgot. Well, no, no, I'm not. I mean, of course, like induction. Yeah. I would no, they forgot recursion. This term 221. Oh, they got it. teaching it right now. So, <laughs> and maybe there's a question for, I know that there are people in the class that are in this room that have taken 221 and they've taken 110 and seen 110, so maybe they should be answering it, but, but it seems like maybe I don't have to do binary search tree. Maybe I don't have to do... I'll let them answer and then I have an answer. And Paul Hawk, uh, Steve and I spent some time talking about this in the context of 121. I think the answer is not to take them out, but to do them better. But not the most representative samples. <laughs> but, but go ahead and have a shot at it. What? Teach to the top. <laughs> well, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> go ahead. Um, yeah, I just have to agree with that. Um, it, it, it's a different context and different syntax and different structures for data definitions. So I think of what we did in 221, like tail recursion, for example, it was short enough. It, it was nice and sweet. and it, um, some people also hadn't seen it. There were, there were, I think there was still a significant number of students who hadn't even seen these things, so it was good to just go over it and kind of like that. But it was definitely a lot easier to do recursion. Recursion was totally comfortable in 2021. Stephen was in a pilot term, so a lot of four fifths of her peers were in one level. So when she got to 221, most of the students around her. That's why we're saying some students didn't have the content. It's Christina took one of the pilot terms. I think you had a slide that actually answers whether you're not to put binary search trees in 221, which is you showed what the results were when people had answered questions about binary search trees on the exam. But that doesn't but that doesn't tell you as much as you could because of that 56% or whatever it was, right. you know, roughly half become CS majors. So you want them to touch it again in two twenty. It's the conclusion that I get from that slide, right? But here's my sense is that, is that, you know, these kids have had three weeks of trees and grass uh, and a lot of recursion. And the more important thing they've had is this notion that once you understand the data, you understand how the code that operates on it must look. And, and so what I would say is that it's a real opportunity for 121, and I think Steve has been doing some of this in 221 in particular, but other courses, to go a bit quicker and more interestingly to go at a bit higher level, which is to, you know, to focus on, well, here's, here's the definition of the data. Therefore, the code, like, you could start using some code templates, not in the C++ sense, but the in, in the sense of, well, you know, since the data looks like this, the code that traverses it must look like this. And you can put up two different traverses of the same data and highlight the only differences. There's things like that you can do that I think 110 students, particularly ones who do well, but even ones who sort of got in the 70s, would be quite receptive to. I think counting on them remembering what the invariant in a BST is would be a mistake. That's not the kind of thing that we're intending for them to take away. We're, 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 we're teaching these examples. A, the power of their data modeling techniques, and B, a little bit of what another part of computer science is. We're not teaching them these example data structures for them to retain the example data structures. That's certainly, you know, when I think about what you're going to know six months later, you're, you're not in your head, right? That's oh, right. God, absolutely. Yeah. So it's something in this space, and we could brainstorm about it. Uh, I'll ask him. Looking first. Hi. I think you are. Okay. Well, it has the same thing as now, but um, then uh, I, I have TA221, and I have actually seen go-to statements from students who took the exam. And 
and I had an enormous effort in going to attend because the students who I don't know expressed some um, discomfort with the transition from one ten to two ten. So I guess I would have asked the same question as Tom, but my question then is how much of an effort will, will the instructors have to make in changing the following courses in order to make the switch from one to ten onwards? And how long will it take for the whole thing to stabilize? Uh, so a couple of things. You could not say a go to thing because they're programming in Java. No, Java. but uh, the, 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 yeah, I actually point. talked to this student and she, the problem was that you know they I don't know what happened in the other courses of course, but they were suddenly lost in C plus plus and so they suddenly blinded, you know, they had no reference about what so <clears throat> You know, so the answer to that is, you know, you know, Gail and other people have been, you know, while me and a bunch of people have been telling ourselves to work on one time, Gail and a bunch of people have been telling themselves to work on two time. Um, I don't think anybody, I think it's fair to say that you know, nobody claims that we have that transition completely worked out. Right? Uh, uh, <laughs> she's just being stuck while I say it. Um, but I think it's getting better. Uh, 210 has this additional idea about, about how you're going to learn a language from Java. And integrating that idea, which I think is a good idea, with the 110 background, you know, we're still doing some work on. Um, I think one of the ways to make learning languages a bit easier for students who take in 110 is to be a little bit, basically the way to look at a 110 student is they learn the language calculus. They've been told that they learn the language calculus. Um, so, to the extent that you can remind them, eh, you know, a bunch of scary stuff, but really, and this is how 210 tries to start, really, look, this defines this, and this calls this, and this calls this, and this calls this, so this thing ends up going from here to here to here. Okay? The idea is to set them up for that, uh, but I don't think we have that totally worked out. Uh, I think we're, we're you know, the answer to when will it stabilize, uh, you should know better. If you want interesting people to work on something, Stability is not what you get. <laughs> <laughs> no, but tomorrow. Or actually, no, hold on, it's next. A lot of interesting stuff there. One thing that I found particularly fascinating is this sort of early oh, injury. So, I'm sorry. What, what's the time we're to let people go so that it's fair for us? Probably 15 minutes. Okay. It's the end of one and a half hour slot. But I won't take all 15 of them. No, no, no I, just, I was told, let them go for daycare. So. Yes. So the one thing I found very interesting is this early and very systematic um, intro to testing. Um, I personally think that's immensely useful, immensely valuable, and you made an intriguing comment there saying, you know, the minimal you should really do is get code coverage, and the recipes that you're teaching there in this course um, go that far. Do they, give, do they go further? The, recipe, okay. the recipes go further. The programming environment will show you in ugly black highlighting that you don't have coverage. Okay. Right. The recipes go farther because you know, and I didn't, I didn't talk much about this, but there's some other data definitions that I didn't stress, other types, because one of the advantages of having a type system with comments as opposed to a static and technical type system is we can have a much richer type system. So we have interval types, okay? whereas interval types in a real type system, eh, you know, it's not happening. Um, because we have interval types, it's really easy to say, well, if this operates on an interval, What's the minimum number of tests? The minimum number of tests, both boundaries in the middle. Okay? You might need more than that, but if you don't have both boundaries in the middle, you're definitely not in the ballpark. And so we have a thing called the randomization of intervals, which is basically, you know, you know, the countdown timer is 30 to 20, 20 to 10, and 10 to 0. So now that becomes three cases over intervals. So what's the, you could say, so what's the minimum number of tests? Nine, except maybe a few more. Because there's three intervals and the boundaries. Um, um, so, of course, it depends on the closed end boundaries and integers versus, right? But the method goes well beyond that. Now, we don't, you know, we don't push on it super, super hard, but every, I guess I should have talked something about this. I should have shown you one of our grading numbers. <coughs> so, in a 110 exam, if we give you a problem, design a function that does food, and you give us the perfectly correct function definition, just the function definition, and it's perfectly correct. The most you're getting for that, the upper bound is 20%, it's probably more like 10%. Like 
If, on the other hand, you give us a good signature and a good purpose and good test cases, and you show where you were going to get the template, and you show the correspondence to the different parts of the problem, and then at the last minute, because we took the data debugger away from you, you screwed up the details of the function, you get 80% or 90%. And, and why we think that's right is that if you work systematically this way, and you happen to have the computer in front of you, you're going to get there. So, building on your question, so most of our questions will have, you know, and there must be n test cases, there'll be one point per test case, and they must cover these. Now, we tend to make extra credit for the really, really super subtle ones. But if we give you an interval, and you don't have the boundaries in the middle, you're losing points. Um, obviously, in later courses, there's much more we're going to learn. But we're trying to set them up so that when people in later courses want to say, OK, well, here's some more issues having to do with testing, they kind of got in their head. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Or tomorrow might have been first. Okay. I'll I'm thinking you. about the questions. I can't keep yeah, track in, of them. In part because uh, to follow up on some of these others about how rocky is the transition to go from 110, 210 to upper division courses. So I'm just four weeks. We're in week four of teaching 213. The last time I taught it, it was the 110 the 111 stream, this time it's the 210 stream. And so, at, although the jury is still out a bit, I'm seeing some very interesting patterns, and seeing this talk makes me ponder more what to do about it. I think there's some things that used to be either small speed bumps, or, you know, small to medium speed bumps that are now more like medium to large speed bumps. And I think a lot of it is that their Java is just much less strong. And so what I think is happening is that we're speed bumping on a lot of stuff we used to assume was super solid that's now somewhere between maybe jello and firm sand, but not concrete. And then we're not yet really deeply exploiting what I'm hoping are the advantages, particularly with the emphasis on testing. I think then the, old, the, the upper division courses are still designed for the, oh, you'll do something kind of lackadaisical and slipshod. So to get it up into the, oh, all that testing you learned, now we want you to keep doing it, but in this syntax, not that syntax, I think that could get strengthened a lot. But we also are going to have to think about how it is that once we can no longer assume very strong Java, but more of a breadth of problem solving, but the Java syntax could actually be a wall for a lot of people, I think that part is still not worked out. And so I think it's going to take a few years for this kind of percolation of getting all of the, 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 the weaknesses shored up and actually exploiting the strengths. I think that's going to be a while. Yeah, and I mean, the purpose of this talk, and it was originally yeah, it was to be last summer. Yeah, was exactly to. Um, <laughs> probably got from here to last summer. It was to sort of let you know some of the things you might exploit. Uh, but yeah, that's exactly it. If you take a 110 student and you, know, you don't take advantage of how they're, of how they're in some way, more, you're in trouble because they're less job and they're more other things. If, if you don't, that, that, that's why we're doing this. I, I think they're better prepared in many ways for a longer term, but they just don't have, they have three months less job happening, and that just is something. So the, uh, the pie charts with the cross sections of the students by major I thought were very interesting. As you said, there's some large chunk of them who are relatively undecided as to what they were doing. Uh, I'm just curious to know if uh, there's been any, if it's possible to really follow up and find out, you know, I suppose there's one of two possible outcomes. So, you know, a student coming from the class would say, yes, now I want to switch and become a computer science major, or no, I never want to touch a computer again and set fire to it. And, uh, <laughs> Do you have any idea whether or not uh, what the outcomes for those? Well, so you, know, you hire somebody who's an expert in writing these kinds of surveys and point and analysis, and you know, the thing about experts is they point out some things that once they point it out to you, you go, oh, yeah. We weren't asking the questions about what they were going to do at the beginning and the end of the term. Um, and so we didn't have, yeah, once it was pointed out, it was kind of, I don't mean to, it was like, oh yeah, that would have been good. So we're doing better on that now, right? We're doing it in all the courses. And also, Allison's built, building this much bigger general attitude survey. It's not just about sort of even major, but... So I think we're going to start to have some more data on that. Um, I will tell you a thing that I feel fairly confident in right. <clears throat> There's a lot of students who take this class. Um, you know, I, I kind of put them in the... 
stereotyped a little bit, but you know, kind of when you have 1,300 to think about, you, you have to bucket them in. Uh, I sort of put them kind of in the arts category. Uh, who came in a little bit nervous because they were they were worried about math. Uh, a lot of students had terrorizing high school math teachers. Uh, and they're actually quite good at the formal symbol thing. It's just that they're not good at the formal symbol thing if you if you spell it MIT um, And I believe that we are getting a, a, a number of students, and I, I didn't teach 101, so I could be wrong, but I think on this score we are doing better than 111 because of some of the simplicity of it. Uh, going, hey, you know, I can do this thing. So I think we are turning a category of students uh, into real interest in this who, who we were turning before. Now we may be losing another category of students, I, I don't know. Although I think that because a week or two of the class is really extraordinarily sophisticated, uh, you know, that's intended in some sense to capture the students in this group and a good space. So we don't have the data, but I have a sense that some of the stuff we've done with regard to the labs and stuff like that is the agents of students who, uh, who we might not have engaged before. Maybe we can't know. Maybe we can know, but I don't know how to know. It's not starting to teach one another anymore. So just a little bit of a follow-up on that. You had the one slide where um, the, there was a chunk of students that I think it was 11% or something like that said they didn't want to see computer science and game type thing, and you were expressing some concern about that. But I was just wondering if there's any sort of um, uh, evidence from what it was like in 111, or more likely, or another option would be another discipline. You know, I've taken courses where I thought, hey, this would be a really cool area, and you got into it, and you said, you know what, this just isn't for me. And so it, it might just be that 11%, that's just normal. Yeah, did I say 11% doesn't bother me for people who don't want to see it again? Okay. If you fail in 15%, it seems like only 11% don't want to see it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I misunderstood that. Uh, oh, you can answer it too. I didn't see it before. Another two. Uh, I don't know what the, you have a sense of what the numbers used to be, right? Sorry, then. Um, you have a sense of what the sort of general happiness numbers used to be in, in, in 111, right? Ah, a great sense. Yeah, you can some data back that we, we haven't done a comparison. So I... <clears throat> the sort of surprising thing on that one, so I'll see if any of the people over here can comment on it, is that this whole question of what does this 110 change how many people want to be in computer science? If it did, we should see a difference this year in our enrollment in second year courses. And if it changed it either way, it is, have we seen a, a step up or a step down, or is it indistinguishable? That is, I haven't noted it being a department topic that we've seen a big shift in any of the If you were right, it'd be great for me. Right. Because the numbers are up. But this so much has changed. You know, the, the jobs thing, the da 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 da. I just don't think you're going to get. To me, this feels like a thing where you. You can listen to what the kids are saying and keep improving the thing, mm -hmm. but to make a hard and fast case about how this is better than what we used to do four years ago, when everything is different, you're just not going to get that. Uh, the numbers are up. On the other hand, we, we put more seats in place. So maybe there was always latent demand. Who knows? And there's actually more TSC in place. I did see you, and you cut your hair. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> since, since you were one dead dean. Yeah, no, from, from when I TA'd it the first time it ran, I've talked to a couple people who have been a part of it, um, who've been a part of 110 and taken this, of course, and their perspective was always that doing things with images and pictures and worlds was much more engaging than doing it with math. And it broadened, if not deepened, the engagement. Part of the yeah, I, I took the course uh, back when it was a prototype, and a lot of people were still doing 111. And I talked to a lot of my friends that was in the math honors class about 111, and they all just said, really easy mark, it's kind of meh, so-so, whatever. Um, and I think that's changed a lot. I think now 110 is exciting. I just did a user study with 50 undergrads um, in different years, and a lot of them, a lot of the ones who showed that they're really good at understanding programs, so they probably have high marks, had uh, actually switched from like physics into comp sci or blah 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 into comp sci and, I, and the big reason cited was 110. So I, I think qualitatively based on both Austin was a gigantic switch. Okay. That's
But to be fair, students did switch in after taking one lesson. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, I just don't think we're gonna. I don't think. I'm pretty confident we're doing well, but to prove it, sorry, you know, I just, uh, you know, I could make a case, but I would tell you what, what the problems are with the case. I mean, that's always the point. There'd be tons of problems. Uh, I, I was told to be very, very careful that especially people with daycare might have to leave. A lot of them may have already left. I am prepared to stay, and some of the other people are prepared to stay, but maybe we should let the people who really have been trying to be polite, make their escape, and then we can talk some more. 